chance for a £25 billion subsidy for business investment is starting I think, today. Uh, how worried are you that some of that money will be spent on white elephants, will be wasted? So if you look at our plan for the economy, the first part is to try and protect people and the economy through the remaining stages of coronavirus yeah. with interventions like furlough. But also we want to look forward and make sure that we turbocharge our recovery. And that's all part of a plan to get people into work, our plan for jobs. And that's what the super deduction will do. It creates a huge incentive for businesses like the one we're in to invest in new plant and equipment that you see around you. And in doing so, uh, they'll get a big tax deduction and that means that they can create more jobs in the process. And that's what this is about getting people into work, creating jobs, turbocharging our recovery. I mean, the worry of some people is we'll get a great surge of investment as we come out of the coronavirus depression, uh, and then it'll just fizzle out in two years' time. Well, investment has been something that as a country for a long time we've not done as much of as we would like to see. And that's why we created the super deduction. And it lasts for two years. It actually lasts for quite a long time. And what we're seeing already is businesses responding to the super deduction, accelerating capital plans. And that's what we want. As we exit this pandemic and the economy reopens, I want to try and get as many people back into work as possible. Sadly, lots of people have lost their jobs. I'm focused on getting them back into jobs. And the super deduction will help do that. We know that it will, or it's forecast to increase business investment, accelerate our recovery, keep unemployment lower than it otherwise would have been. And that's why I think it's the right policy at the right time. I mean, look, everybody wants the fastest recovery possible given the year we've had. But in two years, not only does the super deduction, this big subsidy disappear, but corporation tax is going up. It looks like a double whammy for business. Well, there's lots of other things we're doing to make sure that this remains one of the most attractive places for businesses to locate, to grow, to expand, uh, and to give people the skills they need to succeed in those new opportunities. Free ports are another new in, uh, economic policy that we have put in place at the budget. So Humberside here is benefiting from one, Teesside is benefiting from one, and we're already seeing that pay dividends. Another example would be GE announcing a new offshore wind facility in Teesside after the creation of the Freeport. Mm. Uh, that, that's going to mean hundreds of new jobs and that's happening across the country I hope as some of our other policies roll out and crucially we're giving people the skills they need with investments in apprenticeships uh, and other areas so that they can benefit from those opportunities. Now, I recently interviewed the Chief Economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, and he said to me that he expects the recovery, which we think has start, is starting now, to be the fastest in at least 100 years. Do you share that optimism? Well, I hope Andy is, is right, and I am optimistic, and he's, he's written a lot about this. And I'm optimistic for a, for a few reasons. One is, you know, I do believe that we have done a good job of, of trying to protect the economy through this difficult period so that it is in a strong position to recover. And interventions like the furlough have really helped. That millions of jobs have been protected that otherwise would have been lost. And we're seeing it here in this business that we're in today. At the peak, half of the workforce was on furlough. Now they are all but a handful back at work. The business is looking to grow, increase employment and invest more. So that's a, a case study in what's happening across the economy. And we know that businesses, and the Bank of England chief economist Andy has spoken about this, businesses have about £100 billion of excess cash that they're sitting on that they've built up. And the super deduction is a way to encourage them to invest those savings and in doing so drive the recovery forward and create jobs. So chances are we will get the fastest recovery in 100 years. Well, I mean, I, you know, and, and he's the, the expert, but what I, I am confident that we're in a good position to recover strongly. And then also in part to the vaccine rollout, which is proceeding very well. And that is enabling us to take these steps to safely reopen our economy over the coming weeks and months. Uh, and I know as we do that, the businesses are raring to go. And hopefully the support that we've provided to them has enabled them to get through to this period. And now once they're open again, we can hopefully get things back to normal. Now, fortunately, coronavirus infections are falling. Um, and we're unlocking the economy. Um, you've had quite a lot of criticism for blocking the September circuit-breaking lockdown. Do you regret opposing that lockdown? 
No, I think if you look at what the circumstances were at the time, I think you remember actually that the, the deputy chief medical officer, I remember uh, at the time, uh, said this in, on one of the press conferences, that it wouldn't be a, appropriate, I think was the word he used, and, you know, for, for a national intervention given the varied epidemiological picture that we saw across the country. There were very different caseloads in different parts of the country and a national intervention at the time you know, wasn't considered one that would have necessarily made sense. And actually, you know, Wales went down that route and it didn't in the end stop what needed to happen and we had a new variant that came later on as well. So I think the, look, these are all difficult decisions. They're we difficult, have to weigh but, up, but we have to many weigh of the scientists were things. arguing for a lockdown. Dominic Cummings was arguing for a lockdown. You took the other view. I, I'm just really asking because you will have to give evidence on this. Um, do you regret it? Just remember, like, I, what my job is, and what everyone's job in the Cabinet mm. is, is to provide the Prime Minister with the best advice that they can in their area of expertise. So in the same way that you'd expect the Education Secretary to feed in about this is the impact on children's education and learning, you'd expect me in my job to talk about the impact on people's jobs and livelihoods, and ultimately things that are bad for the economy you know, harm our long-term health as well and our ability to fund things like the NHS. And, and all those things have to go into the decision. These are difficult decisions to make, and it's right that we weigh up all those factors. And at the time, it, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a clear-cut case. And just finally on this point, there are some who say that you played a decisive role in blocking the lockdown. I think you're saying you played a role, but not necessarily decisive. No, I think you know, all these decisions are ultimately ones that the Prime Minister makes, and they're impossibly hard decisions to make. And I've seen him you know, day in, day out for the last year wrestle with all of these things, as only he can. And you know, our job around the Cabinet table is to give him you know, the input from all our different perspectives and the departments that we're responsible for. And he has to weigh these things up. And, and they are enormously difficult decisions. And I think we should underestimate you know, the trade-offs involved in all of these things. But by and large, you know, I, I think as we're seeing now with the vaccine rollout, people can hopefully look forward confidently and optimistically to the safe reopening of our economy and our country and slowly we get our lives back to normal. Now, uh, famously, some might say notoriously, former Prime Minister David Cameron contacted you personally asking for a loan for a business that he was advising. Is it appropriate that some former ministers, former Prime Minister, are able to contact you personally when so many business people who have been in dire straits over the past year simply would not have that opportunity? Well, I think it's important that whoever people are, whether they're prime ministers or anyone else, mm. that they follow the rules and the guidelines that we have in place for lobbying. And we have those rules in place for good reason. And I think whoever you are, it's important that those processes are appropriately followed. And you rejected the application, as it were, but people just feel it's not a fair system that he can actually lobby you directly. Well, I think it's right, as you said, Rob, it's important for people to understand what happened here, that you know, there was a company who approached the Treasury uh, asking for a change to be made to one of our coronavirus support schemes, which they thought would then help lots of other companies. And as you said, we rejected, ultimately, uh, the, the suggestion and decided not to take that, that forward. But it is right that as an institution, we engage with stakeholders, and we do that all the time when people come with policy suggestions. And remember, we were at a difficult point in the crisis, and it's right that we engage with people, um, but ultimately the decision was taken not to take it, the proposal forward. Now, you're a numbers man. Um, one of the great targets of this Prime Minister, uh, of this government, is to level up. So, by the end of this Parliament, how much should the gap, the income gap, between North and South have been narrowed? Well, I think you raise a really interesting point. What, you know, what does levelling up mean, right? And, it, and, and people, what's the measure of success? Yeah, and I think, and that's something that actually that I think it's, it's right that we have a clear understanding of, because it means lots of different things to lots of people. I'll tell you what our approach to it is, and then, and then we can decide how best to measure it. So the first thing I'd say, it's not just about North and South. And I think we, we shouldn't get drawn into that idea that it's just all about the North. There are plenty of people across the country who feel that they haven't had the opportunities that, that they deserve and that that opportunity is not evenly spread across our nation. And that equally applies if you're probably growing up potentially in a village in the southwest of England as you are in a town in the North or here on Humber side. So it's not about North versus South. It's not about urban versus rural. It's just about everyone feeling that they've got a shot at success, that but opportunity there is, is evenly spread. grotesque inequality, some would say. You have committed yourself to reducing that inequality. So how are we going to, what is the measure on which we can judge you? So I think, 
it's right that we, you know, as we get into the spending review, for example, later this year, uh, we will start actually publishing metrics and outcomes which we talked about uh, at budget and previously. So we can measure our progress against these things. And I think the thing I would focus on is how do you measure opportunity? And it's not, it's not as simple as reducing it to a number. There are lots of things that provide opportunity for people. The thing that I focus on is, is the availability of skills and education. We know how important that is for people to make a success of their lives. So that's something that we care about. We also care about the places we live in. And can we have pride in the physical beauty of the places that we live? And that's why our town's funds and high street funds are so important. And they make sure that our town centres have a life and vibrancy to them, that people, people, people feel proud of the places they call home. So there's but, lots of different aspects to it. But just a very simple yes or no, does the gap between rich and poor matter? Is that a metric that you should seek to narrow? I, I think the opportunity gap absolutely matters, right? But and, how do you measure the opportunity gap well, if it's not in, in, in the form of incomes? Well, because there are lots of different aspects of opportunity. So one is education and skills. Do you have access to the skills you want and do you have access Very to Very hard get... to measure with precision, though. And I think that's fair, and it's right that we try and flesh out what's the best way for us to think about it. And the other thing is to think about it, another way to think about opportunity is transport connectivity. You know, is your area one which you can travel to where the opportunities might be? If you live in a town outside of a big city, is it easy for you to get in and out? And that's why our investments around our big cities, where lots of smaller towns are, to connect those places up better as part of our record amount of investment in transport over this parliament, I think will close all these gaps. So I think, I but, think but the gap make... between rich and poor is not one that you're going to be targeting. But I, I think it, it will close as a result of doing all these things. But I think the key thing I focus on is, is opportunity. How do we make sure that wherever you grow up in this country, wherever you happen to live, that there is great opportunities for you to do what you want to do in life and have a successful, fulfilling life for you and your family and it's a great place to live. You know, that's what this government is committed to. And, you know, whether it's the Treasury opening a campus in Darlington, whether it's our infrastructure investments, whether it's free ports, whether it's our town's funds, that's what you will see relentless focus on from all ministers. Now, we've seen the Commission for Race Equality's report mm. today. Um, one of its conclusions is that the UK sh should be seen as a model for white majority countries. Lots of anger. I've seen this morning, particularly from the black community about that. What, what, what they've seen is disproportionately high number of black people dying during the coronavirus crisis because of the work they do, because of deprivation, something that the Commission acknowledges. Is the Commission right that the UK should be seen as a model when it comes to equal opportunity for people from all racial backgrounds? Well, you're a bit ahead of me because I haven't actually seen the report, which I don't believe has, has been fully published yet. But what I would say, I think there was a, a, a significant panel of people involved in putting the report together, and it, by all accounts, is a very comprehensive piece of work. So I look forward to seeing it, and the government will obviously reflect on its recommendations. You know, what I would say, if, if they have concluded that uh, actually we've made enormous progress, that is something I would agree with. You know, that's not to say there aren't instances of racism that, of course, exist in this country. But if I think about the things that happened to me when I was a kid, I can't imagine those things happening to me now. And I think that's a sign of the progress we've made as a country. You know, that said, I, I think another thing that's been touched on is the fact that not, not all ethnic minority groups are the same and people will have different experiences. And it's important that we're not complacent about that and we recognize there's still progress to make. And that's why the Prime Minister commissioned this report and which is why we should reflect on its findings properly. I mean, one of the things that um, actually the Prime Minister, I think, himself signals being a matter of great pride was uh, that, you know, here you are from the, what he would have said is the BAM, BAME community as Chancellor. The report has said that the BAME, the BAME label, is redundant and that's not how we should think about things. Well, what, what do you think of that view? So again, I haven't, I haven't seen the report or read the context around it, but I, I, look, I, I, agree with, I agree with the premise that, that it's wrong to lump all ethnic minority groups together as one homogenous block. Clearly there are differences between whether it's not just South Asian and, and black, even within those groups, you've got black African, black Caribbean, and you've got Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and Indian groups. So even there, there are multiple ethnic minority groups that would ordinarily fall under that label, and they will all have different experiences and outlooks that we should be respectful of and sensitive to and think about that when we think about policy. But I think enormous progress has been made. And you know, when we look at the ethnic minority pay gap, 
the changes in educational attainment, diversity in the police forces, you know, those are all areas which I, I hope the report will recognise and acknowledge. Great progress has been made in this country and we should all feel very proud about that, whilst acknowledging, of course, there's further work to do. A couple of very quick questions. Um, in terms of transparency in politics, George Osborne published his tax return. Will you publish yours? You know, I, I follow all the regular cabinet office reporting, so all my transparency declarations are made in accordance with that. So that's a no, I think. I, I mean, I follow all the cabinet office guidelines, and they <laughs> have all, like my, no, all the details. <laughs> okay. And then, um, finally, as you may know, ITV News has been doing what we think of as some quite important work looking at housing conditions in this country, and what we've uncovered is vulnerable families living in really appalling social housing council housing, water pouring through ceilings. There are some who say at a time when councils say they can't fix it because they haven't got the money, it's just the wrong thing for the government to have spent 2.6 million on a press studio. Well, on, on, on the report that you said, I, it's concerning to see that, and I haven't seen all the details, but obviously that's concerning. And that's why there is a legal obligation on social housing providers to make sure that the homes they provide are fit for people to well, live in. What, what if they're saying so, they haven't got enough money? Well, so I do, look, in this particular instance, there is a, there's a regulator whose job it is to have a look at this, and I know that they have been in touch with the council uh, and that work is ongoing. And I think you spoke to the housing secretary earlier today who obviously is looking at this, and I know you would have got more details from him about the situation. And then, if I may, just one final, final question. You endorsed Deliveroo as a great technology company company, shares have tanked. Do you feel a bit embarrassed? Oh gosh, no. I mean, I know, having spent my life previously to politics being a business, share prices go up, share prices go down. And I mean, uh, uh, you know, we should celebrate success in this country. I think yesterday we also had the news that Oxford Nanopore, which is a fantastic UK life sciences company, has been involved in fighting coronavirus, also going public here in the UK. It's important, you know, businesses like that feel that they can stay in the UK to raise capital. That's why we've made some reforms to uh, to how capital is raised here, which will be good for our competitiveness. And, you know, you talk about delivery. I think I remember Facebook when it first IPO'd. I think the share price halved over the next few months. Uh, and then, obviously, we all know what happened after that. I so I would, uh, would love to have bought shares. Yeah, so, shares again, I, wouldn't, I, I think that's pretty much, roughly, that's probably what happened with the Facebook shares after they IPO'd over the next few months. So. Chancellor, very good to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Robert.